Good well, good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us tonight as we commence our fall 2013 Gray's Lecture Series. <clears throat> it's an honor for me to introduce our featured speaker tonight. He's somewhat new to the faculty at Chatham State College, Dr. Dave Nesham, right there. He's an assistant professor of history on campus. He specializes in the environment, the North American West, um, the Great Plains. Yeah. Also, <laughs> he received his BA from Black Hill State, his uh, Master's of Arts from Northern Arizona State, and his PhD from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Um, it's an honor to have you tonight, Dr. Nesham. Would you please join me in welcoming you. Thank you very much. And I want to just begin by thanking Sean for inviting me to be here tonight. It's a great privilege and an honor. When I was a grad student, pondering the possibilities of knowing what I now know, I thought someday maybe I can get a grant and I can go do this ridiculous research project. And thanks to the Research Institute at Chatham State, I'm able to do that. Joe Forstrom is here tonight, so I want to applaud my funding. And then I wouldn't. Charles Snare, that's right, and that's it. That's in, assemb that's in assembly, right? Yes. Yes. Other people who will remain nameless. Also, Maria Shikotsky was my undergraduate research assistant on this project. It wouldn't be done without her, and that's absolute truth. I don't have enough time to do this stuff. So she did my work. Um, and then <laughs> Terry Dawson, I want to get her thanked initially, and then we'll thank her later on, and that'll become abundantly clear why. So bass fishing and tribal dispossession at Bidet Ihonke, or Lake Andes, South Dakota. Did anybody come for the bass fishing? <laughs> yeah. There's some bass fishing. It's really important to my story. I'm not going to do a lot of angling history tonight, though. So it's a, it's, it's a bait and switch, I'm just telling you flat out. Tribal dispossession. Did anybody come for the tribal dispossession? Yeah, all right, some people. Notice it's not native dispossession, and that's on purpose. There's an individual story. There's a composite of individual stories here. But with the data that I assembled, with the help of all these other people, there's a, there's a macro story. There's a bigger story. So there's a couple, couple things going on, but I want to focus on the tribal dispossession. Bidet Ihonke, that means the lake at the end. Ihonke is also Yankton, Ihonkton, so it's the Yankton Lake. So Yankton Sioux Indians are part of this story, and they really identify with this place. So that's why I put their name first. Um, one of the tribal members I spoke with in my research said they like to go up to Lake Andes every once in a while and just remind everybody that the lake is still theirs. But that's in some dispute. OK, and it's a CSC Research Institute project. Why I study this place? I study a place called Lake Andes, South Dakota. It's in the center of the Yankton Sioux Reservation. It is a prairie pothole. It's been around for about 10, 12,000 years. But my question was, what does wild mean? In my MA research, I looked at bison. Historians who write about bison talk about them being semi-domesticated. I talked to bison ranchers. I said, are your bison wild? They said, I don't trust them. <laughs> so I said, what does this wild mean? What does this semi-domesticated mean? It was just an idea. I didn't really want to be Buffalo Dave. So I wasn't going to do Buffalo again. I wrote an incredibly well-informed, passionate, um, you know, erudite, proposal, 12 pages of blithering nonsense, and my committee said, Dave, we have no idea what you're talking about. Pick a place. So I picked Lake Andes. What I realized as I went through this question of what does wild mean is I can't really get to wild. As a historian, I don't have the tools. But I can get to management, a really, really brilliant veterinarian. I was talking to him about feral animals. Feral are cattle that used to be domesticated and they've been you know, out somewhere. And now they're considered feral, kind of sort of wild. And for him, it was management. And I said, management. Managers leave records. Management is something that can, historians can grab onto. The other realization I had when I was doing my master's research was that s tribal, state, and federal makes a huge difference. And Lake Andes has all three right on top of each other. 
So it served my purposes. That's almost good enough. But I was still looking. I wasn't ready to settle on Lake Andes. And finally, agriculture. I found one little reference to a federal agricultural station in the BIA years. And where there's federal bureaucrats, there's a paper trail. And historians like paper trails. And I also really think you can't tell the story of a place on the Great Plains if you don't talk about ag. So even though my question was wild, always in the background I wanted ag to be there somehow. All right. This is my ag agent, Fergus Crone. Look at that guy for just a little while. <laughs> I think it's one of the more profound faces you'll run across. Doesn't it look deep? I think he looks serious. I had in my mind Fergus Crone this petty federal bureaucrat, this paper-pushing administrator out to change the ways of the Yankton. And then I got an email from one of his relatives after I gave a paper and said, you write about Fergus Crone? He's my great whatever, whatever. And I said, I do. Do you have any pictures? And she sent me this wedding picture. That's so cool. That's the internet, right? That's just weird things happening. Um, and then Fergus. I just don't know what to do with Fergus. Oh, by the way, issued the epistle. That's what the, in the email. She sent the letters or sent the photo and she said, the story in the family is he was issued a pistol. Why would a farm agent need a pistol? Right? Why would a farm agent need a pistol? Because his job description, this is his self-reflection on what he does, he was asked by a higher level federal bureaucrat, what's your job and how does it relate to the white society surrounding Lake Andes? And he responded with his fairly lengthy response. Um, my ears, law and order. I got excited because I like Foucault and I like discourses of power, right? Um, but it's really quite a list, isn't it? Anyway, I just think Fergus Crone is a really interesting guy. And for the purposes of my study, he also left records. And even more amazing, his records survive. So what I did for this study was compile a new data set, but I had old data sets. One of the old data sets was the initial allotments. Someone years ago had put them up on the web. I found them. My research has proved that it's pretty accurate. So there's this huge data set. Then I found the Fergus Crone daily activity report and annual reports for a very long time. This is what he did every day. Who he visited, how many times he visited them, what he visited them about. I don't, know what to, I don't know what to do with it, right? I had this huge record. I didn't really know what to do with it. So I crunched some numbers. And then finally, there's newspaper articles behind all this. Um, there's a digital website called Casting Digital Nets. I wrote a grant. It was accepted. Someone else has done all the work on this. Um, that's how I work as an academic, by the way. I write grants and have other people do the work. It's a good strategy. Um, so there's a whole bunch of things informing this, this, this study. What I wanted to do with this grant, compile land tenure. When did Yankton's own it? When did Yankton stop owning it? I'm going to hold off. I'm not going to explain why that is. But possession is really important in the story, OK? Um, and then the other thing we did because we kind of ran out of time and research grants are unpredictable. We did cross-referencing. So those other data sets, we combined them with the existing data sets. We're getting this rich archive. And then we have genealogy and age stuff. So now I know not only when Paul Peacott sold his land, but how old he was and who his mother was and who his brother and sister were. All kinds of information, right? Just trying to make some arguments. This is my 1906 map. This is what I set out to do. Find out when this body of land turned into non-Yankton. I had a map, 1906. And then I had a map, 1931. And I'm not going to hone in on it, but things have changed around the map. 1906, 1931, that's a big chunk of time. And it's really important for what I'm doing to figure out when the change happened, or was there a change that happened? How did this change from a Yankton lake to a non-Yankton lake occur? That's my question. Simple enough? 
All right, when I was writing my dissertation, my committee, who really didn't know what I was doing, said, oh, Dave, you're writing a biography of a lake. And I bristled. I did not like that. I'm a sophisticated historian. Biography is cheating. Biography is telling the story of one person. How hard is that? They, they're boring. They die. Stuff happens in between. But you know what? I did tell the story of a lake. I did tell a biography of a lake. And so I'm going to give you that biography fairly quickly, just so you kind of know what's going on. I picked Lake Andes for kind of obscure reasons. And I'm pretty much the only person who's ever asked these questions. So when I went looking for Lake Andes stuff, anything that was Lake Andes was just incredible. It was a great find. This was my favorite find. This is from J.E. Todd. He's the state geographer, or I'm sorry, geologist of South Dakota. This is a scientific report he authored. This is the second principal moraine of the Dakota Glacier. There's another illustration of the first principal moraine. It comes all the way down here. Second moraine, back up here. And as you can see, Lake Andes. It's alive, right? It's the first time I ever saw a reference to Lake Andes. That's kind of exciting. So one thing we know about this place, it's carved by a glacier. And for its entire history, for thousands of years, it would go dry about every 20 years, because it's on the Great Plains and there's cycles of drought. All right, so it's an old place. It's not as old as the Earth, but it's an old place. Another really significant event in the life of Lake Andes, allotment. There's other things that happen. There's a Yankton Sioux Reservation that's created. There's some legislation that's passed. But for the purposes of our conversation, we're just going to focus on allotment. This is the federal government saying, Yankton Indians, we want you to be good American citizens. And we're going to give you 160 acres of land. And that's how you're going to become a good American citizen, by being a farmer. The white is claimed allotments. And what do we see? What do we see, Joe? The land around the lake has been claimed. The land around the lake has been claimed, right? I didn't even know if this lake was important. I had no idea what it was. I just studied it because it had some things. But by 1892, Yanktons have decided to settle around the lake, right? It's important to them. It wasn't necessarily important in their pre-reservation economy, but it's important to them. There's a cycle of drought. 1890s, there's a huge drought on the Great Plains. The federal government is overseeing the Yankton Sioux Reservation. And Lake Andes, which sometimes is 12, 14 miles long, a mile, mile and a half wide, it's a fairly good sized lake. It dried up. It was, a, it was a shiver, a sliver of its former self. So the federal government, with its science and its knowledge and its money, sinks artesian wells that they know are going to fill, they know they're going to flow. They kick out about 1,500, 3,000 gallons. I want to say an hour. Anyway, a lot of water. They do it. This is the artesian well. I don't know if you can see it. It's just a pipe sticking out of the ground spewing water out, right? Just going crazy 24 hours a day, spewing water. They sunk two wells in 1896 and then two more in 1907. I couldn't help myself. I had to underline and highlight. <laughs> I didn't know 1907 was important until sometime this weekend, actually, to be quite honest. The research project wasn't done until two weeks ago. I should be fully forthright. So these are somewhat preliminary results. Then, and this makes perfect sense, if you have a beautiful lake, stick some fish in it. And stick some fish in it that people want to catch. The US Fish Commission, there's a long story about that. There's networks of power and knowledge and all kinds of fun things that I'd love to chat about. But once again, for our Graves lecture, we're going to talk about two stockings. One, the north end of the lake, 300 fish. One, the bottom end of the lake, 300 fish. Different towns. One was at the north end of the lake. You get the idea, right? Two different groups wanted to put bass in this lake. And the bass go wild. There's no fish, or at least as far as I can tell, there's no fish. Remember, the lake goes dry about every 20 years. Introduced bass in 1899. After that, they don't do a whole lot. The bass literally go insane. There's lots of bass. I've never counted them. That's like stage four of this project. And there's more stocking. But really, really quickly, the lake becomes known for its bass fishing. 
An interesting thing happens on the way to Lake Andes, and that is America becomes motorized. So right around here, we put some bass in a lake. The town's founded in here a little bit. But right when the fishery takes off, the bass fishery, that's like the fish in the lake. That's what we call it as a fishery. I don't know why. The fishery takes off the same time motorized traffic, the same time that Americans can really get to this place. And guess what else happens? Non-resident anglers, here's our fishing part. It's all There, now we're done fishing. They peak, right? 180 non-resident fishing licenses. Lots of people are interested in this lake, and that is 1916, 1917. This thing, I don't know what's going on here. I have some ideas. One, I made an error. <laughs> Two, there's lack of enforcement. And this feeds into why the lake crashes in about 10 years. But it's just a theory. I don't have any basis to support that. But we have a lot more fishing going on at the lake. We have a lot more people getting to the lake. And we have resorts crop up around the lake. We have Bass Beach, we have Rest Haven, we have Dreamland, we have Desira, we have probably about 10 more that I can't remember. But around this fairly good sized lake, all these little, I mean, they're modest fishing things, but they're resorts. We shouldn't look at this from like our Vegas jaundice view. This is a recreation economy, right? This is a major thing going on in this place. Um, and famous for fishing, that's their, that's their local tagline. All right, now here's where the story gets sad. The artesian wells fail. They quit producing water. This is something artesian wells do with occasion. Somebody brought some carp to the lake. Nobody has taken credit for the carp yet in my research. <laughs> Lots of people claim the bass. Nobody has claimed the carp. Also, there's a lot of overfishing. At least I think there's a lot of overfishing. I don't quite have the data for that. And then in the 1930s, another drought comes along. <coughs> and we have a stinking mud hole filled with carp. That's what the locals call it. And they're mad. They're mad at the Republicans. They're mad at the Democrats. They're mad at everybody. <coughs> and they want somebody to fix this damn lake. And the federal government comes in and fixes the lake. OK, this is the part where dispossession actually happens, sort of. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, actually it's the Bureau of Biological Survey at this point. Bureau of Biological Survey comes in, starts to manage the lake as a national wildlife refuge. In order to do that, they get easements from individual landowners. So every individual landowner around the lake says, federal government, you can now manage this lake. At least that's the official records. I found one honest bureaucrat later on who said, we can't find the easements, and I really don't know if we actually did get permission from everyone. But it's a fait accompli. The, the lake, by this point, is no longer a Yankton possession. It's no longer a Yankton authority to manage. It's, the, the dispossession has occurred on so many levels. But I still don't know my answer to my question. When did it happen, and does bass fishing actually have anything to do with it? I wrote my whole dissertation with the surmise that it did, based on two maps. Something happened between 1906 and 1931. Any questions so far? I've kind of gone a little fast. So we got a lake that's been around for a whole long time. There wasn't fish in it. Bam, the federal government puts fish in it. And it's famous for fishing. Even the Yanktons who live around the lake recall the bass. There's no recollection of you know, the sparse bullhead fishery that may or may not have existed. Map-centered inquiry. It all starts with a couple maps and me not knowing anything. Um, if you want, you can bump around on the Casting Digital Nets website. And I've got little essays about a couple different segments from these maps that I knew enough about to write just a little bit on. For the purpose of time, I'm going to talk about one group. What stands out in this? They're all peacoats. They're all peacoats, although it's actually peacot. Okay. Go figure, right? It's peacot. All the names are spelled weird or pronounced weird on Yankton. I don't know why. They're all peacots, right? Actually, these guys aren't, and these guys aren't. Um, this is 1906. Not a big surprise. This is 1931. <coughs> Who's left? 
back to that other map? When you say they are not peacocks, are they not Yankees? Oh, I knew you'd ask that good question, Kurt. Um, this is IT. That means Indian Trust. But I do believe the link hearts are non-Yankton. This is Indian, I think, but I'm not sure. It's a little weird. The, there's, there's plots of land, and then there's lots of land, and there's little things that connect them together. It's a map. It's not a perfect representation. So I'm not entirely sure. Um, but for the most part, yeah. So we just have George left. Um, and it's sad, right? I think it's kind of sad. And I'm kind of curious. Why George? Right? What did George do? Either right or wrong. I'm not sure. But what did George do? Or what did the other people do? Before I did my research, I knew stuff that historians know. Paul Peacott, in 1968, gave an oral interview to Joseph Cash who's another guy who studied the Yankin quite a bit. So all this I know about Paul Peacock from traditional sort of historiographical sources, not this crazy going into an archive and creating your own thing. Um, interestingly enough, Peacock, Paul, in the 20s, leaves Lake Andes and goes to Pikes Peak in Colorado and works in the tourism industry. I don't know what that means. It's just interesting to me. But here's what I do know, thanks to the Research Institute. I know that Paul Peacock was 27 years old, right around 1907. I know who his mama ma and his papa pa are. And I can figure out, if I do a little more research, more genealogy going back. It's rich stuff. I don't know exactly what I'm going to do with this, other than throw it up on the web and let other people play with it. Because that's something I can do with that website. So that's kind of fun. It is interesting to me, though, that George, right, remember a George, George is 14 in 1907. So he's baby boy. Again, I don't know enough to make any conclusions on that, but I don't know. It's interesting all the same. This is what I have. I have 853 lines that look like this, and they're about 30 fields going across. Um, it's not a real simple one-to-one -one relationship between documents and tenure and tracing these things. It's a messy process. I wish it was neater, but it's not a really clean process. I have money amounts. I'm really interested in that. I haven't got to that level of, of data crunching. You know, do women get more money or less money than men when they sell their land? I have no idea. I'm really curious about that stuff. Um, but we do know Paul, age mm, 28, sells his share to his parents, who then sell it for money. And there's already this thing. Oh, no, I'm sorry, not that thing. Money here, sell for more money. And then they get, the land company, when they sell it, about the same amount as the Peacots did. So we're not seeing defrauding, necessarily. I don't know if that's a pattern that's going to hold out. but. There's more data to be crunched. How are we doing on time? OK, good, because I'm almost done. Um, what I did with all this data is I made a couple charts. I'm going to start with one that makes almost no sense, because that's where I was. Here's the big results. Now, there's trust patents, and there's fee simple patents, and there's sheriff deeds, and there's quick claim deeds, and there's warranty deeds. And there's contract for deeds. And there's, there's a mind-boggling amount of things that could be a real estate instrument in this chart. It's just the grossest assembly. It's like how many things happened in any given year. We got a big old spike right about 1907 and a big old spike right about 1916. Worst case scenario, it would have looked like this. Right? I would have crunched the data, and there would have been no discernible trend. And what did I see? I saw 1916, two years or a year, I never can remember, after the first annual Fish Days celebration, when Lake Andes made it its business to have people come in and fish at Lake Andes. And whoa, that's a spike. That's what I would call a correlation. 
From 1807, and I'll get to that in a second, because really what happens is I don't really know anything, right? So Terry Dawson comes over and teaches me how to do a pivot chart. What a pivot chart allows me to do is take all those instruments and then break them out into their subcategories. Um, notice over here is miscellaneous. There's like 12 different things in miscellaneous. Um, I was thinking Bob Knight might be here. So in my very last slide, I give you the miscellaneous. Mm -hmm. But we're going to ignore it. Just trust me, it's stuff that's not that important. Trust patents. Trust patent means an Indian gets the land, but it's with the trust of the federal government. For 25 years, the federal government will hold it in trust because Indians aren't ready to have land. So you can't sell a trust patent. You need a fee simple patent to be able to sell it. We have a deed of uh, inherited land. Those kind of peak over here a little bit. But for the period between 1890, what is it? 1889 to 1905, not a whole lot happens necessarily. The town of Lake Andes is founded right in here. All right, here's the next one. This is, this is, the, uh, this is the money shot, right? This is 1906 to 1931. This was my question. <clears throat> These are warranty deeds. This is land changing hands. Somebody buying, somebody selling. No recognition of who owns it. This spike right here, though, that's fee simple patents. That's Yankton's getting that title to their land that they can turn around and sell. And then we see some sales. Hmm. Me? I'm convinced. Oh, sorry about that. I'm convinced. That's strong to me. But I don't know. There's one other thing that concerns me quite a bit. And that is this. Why is something happening in 1940? Remember I just told you dispossession was an accomplished fact in 1935? Oh man, I hate it when that happens. I was happy with the 1916 data. I don't know what's going on with 1940. I really don't. My hope is it's an error. Because one of the forms, it has the year the patent was given, and then the year of anniversary of independence. It's the strangest form. So you have 1916, and then you have year of the anniversary of independence, 140. So some of the 40s, I'm thinking, hmm, maybe that's a 40 independence, not a 40 year. But I have to double check the data. And all this stuff is handwritten. It's not easy to figure out. And then there's scans of it as well. So Maria did an incredible job. It's just when you have 1,000 fields of data, questions start to creep in a little bit. OK, so this is the final distilled, simplest approach whatsoever. Warranty deeds versus fee simple patents. Remember 1907? The second set of artesian wells. The lake started to go dry. People were worried. And the federal government came in and bolstered that lake up. I don't know that that decision played in the minds of those 53 transactions, but I think it might have. And then this one I'm much more convinced on, and that is fish days and then this spike in fee simple patents. Also corroborated with the fishing licenses and the starting of the resorts and all kinds of other things that are going on. But I'm still not totally ready to put it to bed. Because I want to find out who's selling this land. Who's getting the fee simple patent? Are these people that have died? Is this a generational thing? Or is it more maybe closely related to fishing? I don't know yet. But it's really exciting to have this huge data set. And I'm prepared to say that fishing added to Yankton dispossession if not being the contributing factor. And that's, that's pretty cool. So thanks, CSC Research Institute. Thanks, you guys. Um, this is a homestead patent. There's not supposed to be any homesteads on Indian reservations. I don't know what's going on there either. I'm so confused. No, I'm kidding. So there we are. Any questions? Yeah, Joe. Who was buying the land? Um, there's a strong Eastern European. It's, I mean, it kind of looks, I haven't done a lot of work on that, but it kind of looks a lot like 
any other place on the Great Plains. Mm -hmm. I have a chapter that focuses on, on ag specifically. Mm -hmm. And it really just, it just seems like agricultural development kind of anywhere else. Although there is a huge, there's a bohunk contingent. When I do research in <coughs> Lake Andes, the ladies who work in the registered deeds office are kind of casual and they talk about bohunks all the time. Bohemian, that's what that is. So a check or something like that. Yeah, Kurt. Were we, um, just thinking of George Picot, the kid. Do you know his education? Is he a boarding school graduate? Is he somehow special being the junior? And I would awesome? think he'd probably be a boarding school graduate. I don't know for sure. Does he hang on to that parcel for, for a while after this? I don't even know. I haven't got to the individual level of, of this at all yet. It's there. And, I, and I'm excited to get there, but at this point, we're really just out at the, you know, the broadest level. Does something really happen? Yeah. Is there a, uh, another story of an animal dispossession? I mean, bass don't explode not eating anything. They're not eating a sweet oil. Do the pocket plates <laughs> carry amphibians before the bass incursion? I'm the bass sure there is a... Placed by the minnows that they used to... <laughs> there was, there had to be wildlife in the lake. It had to be sort of productive. Um, also, bass cannibalize themselves. This is an interesting strategy they have. So they make lots of babies, and then if they need to, they eat them. But usually, they're very protective parents. <laughs> usually, but but they will cannibalize if they need to. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. Thank you, guys.